Hey everyone, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Today we're actually going to do something a little bit different. It's going to, as people who've watched the channel for a while know, one thing that I talk about often is green energy policy and green energy investment. Oftentimes saying you cannot have green energy policy without green energy investment. And I wanted to expand upon that. So I partnered up with Scoot Science to tell a little bit of their story. This piece is brought to you and sponsored by Scoot Science. So everything that I'm saying is about them. I'm going to have a description I'm going to have links to their content below in the description box if you're interested in checking them out. And I think that there's a lot to learn from how they think about markets and how we can think about the broad brush of green energy. So getting right into it, the rising tides moment, defining the E and ESG. History primer, let's kind of return to basics and just dive into what all of this stuff means. For anything to work, there has to be an element of risk tied to it. The first person to milk a cow was definitely taking a risk, but the payoff was large in theory, right? The risk reward dynamic is a little bit tricky because people want to be compensated for the risk that they take on or else it really isn't worth it. Venture funds are sort of the in-between risk takers. They help founders milk cows, which is kind of a gross analogy, but hey, with me here. It's a balance of risk and reward. Venture money goes into industries that seem to have a lot of potential upside, dairy in this case, and help founders milk as many cows as possible. For a less dairy-related example, the very first venture funds were whaling companies, buying risk sharing and reward into investing for a unique way. Whaling expeditions were incredibly risky, nearly 30% of all boats were destroyed, and someone had to shoulder that risk. Into our financers, what whaling was focused on creating matched incentives between owners, managers, and employees, the crew, and every Everyone really was paid on the profits of the voyage. Nobody got a salary and everybody benefited from the same upside. The investors would do spray and pay with different voyages, but the incentive model remained favorable to the whalers themselves. Knowing how the industry worked was very important to success, as so investors used agents to decide which whaling captains to work with. As written here, quote, they studied which captains had the best records, helped rich families spread their money between molten whaling ships, hoarded knowledge about whale hunting grounds, and drew up profit sharing agreements to incentivize crews to stay out at sea. This led to specialization of expertise expertise, and the concentration and eventual disbursement of large amounts of wealth. Since then, the VC space has evolved, hello Web3, but with over $60 billion invested in climate tech between 2013 to 2019, there is room for more investment in the oceans, for VC to return to its roots, so to speak. Currently, most climate-based investing is around mobility and transport, which is good. Emissions have grown 71% since 1990, but oceans are essentially absorption tools for the impact of climate change. Oceans take on emissions and heat, absorbing about 30% of CO2 emissions, which have increased 4x since the Industrial Revolution, which makes the ocean much more volatile, as one would imagine. As the New York Times highlights, as the planet has warmed, the oceans have provided a critical buffer. They have slowed the effects of climate change by absorbing 93% of the heat trapped by greenhouse gases humans pump into the atmosphere. And that's why it's so important to invest in the ocean. The word ocean is only mentioned twice in PwC's The State of Climate Tech 2020, which seems low considering how the ocean is 70% of the Earth's surface and 80% of it is unexplored. So investing in oceans, how does one invest in the ocean? Aquaculture is an ancient industry, but one that is relatively untapped in terms of investment opportunity. If seafood companies are stable, but relatively unknown in the world of Nestle's and Unilever's, they are interesting parts of the market because of the stability of cash flows that they offer in the profitability of the market that they exist in. In one segment of the market near coastal salmon farms have a production value of $17.1 billion and have generated a compound ROCE of about 24% between 2009 to 2019. This is a quote from this Norwegian hedge fund manager. Across all roughly 200 publicly listed companies involved in seafood globally, we have some astonishing figures historically. Revenue growth has been in aggregate about 6 to 7% for the whole sector for a number of years. Look at Nestle, Unilever, these giants, how they are priced how they grow. You'll find that a portfolio of public seafood companies grows much faster at a much lower multiple with very decent cash flows slash dividend support which is pretty solid. Salmon farming is not only a relatively profitable investment opportunity, but it's an impactful one. Salmon companies allow for three very important things in a world that needs to go greener sooner rather than later. Number one is improved environmental impact. Number two, a solution to ESGification. And number three, investment opportunities to truly make a difference. But how do you tap into this space? So number one, investing in oceans. So Scoot Science, the sponsor and partner of this piece, developed a tool called Seavest that allows investors to invest in the ocean industry. They aggregate data from 3,000 salmon sites 
companies all over the world and have built a model that helps investors understand the space better. Just as whaling VCs needed agents to understand whaling, investors need tools like Seavest to understand salmon farming better. Seavest is about true impact investing and has helped to refine a space where sustainability and returns can coexist. It's a balance of risk, return, and impact and helps to encourage investment in our ocean spaces. It offers uncorrelated returns and high yield opportunity in an increasingly yield hungry world. A very brief and simplified version of the tool. It takes into consideration environmental conditions of the ocean. So number one, ocean temperature, and number two, dissolved oxygen to parse out what areas are the best balance of sustainability and suitability for investment opportunities. As you can see in this graph, Tasmania's suitability has suffered. It's below the trend line. Not This is sort of an oversimplification, but it's not quote unquote the best investment opportunity, whereas Faroe Islands and central Norway have improved. Above the line means improved suitability relative to the longer term average. So it's an improving suitable space for environmental conditions. And then this gets into the farms themselves. So the ocean itself is very important, but what about the actual salmon farms, right? Farms are about a four to eight million dollar investment up front going towards net pens, feed services, crews, etc., and usually deliver a maximum annual revenue of about seven to ten million dollars. The goal of the farms are to produce good salmon through two main cost levers. Number one is to minimize feed costs per unit of growth. Basically, it's healthy couponing, but for fish. How can you make sure the salmon are eating the best possible food at the lowest possible price? And feed costs can be minimized through things like transitioning from deforestation free soy and switching to algae oil from fish oil, improving the lives of the fish and the bottom line for the farmers. And number two is maximizing the number of fish that reach weight. This circles back to the feed cost minimization and making sure the fish are fed efficiently and effectively. The fish operate within a three year production cycle. Number one is the fertilized eggs are grown in smolts. Number two, the smolts are then transported to sea based pens for one to two years. And then salmon are then harvested when they are between four to five kilograms in weight. It's a process that has been perfected by a relatively family controlled industry and mostly concentrated in central Chile and southern Norway, which is about 60% of farmed salmon supply. So it's a tightly knit industry with geographical constraints and a lot of opportunity for growth, meaning that the excess profits are a sign that the industry can and should see more investment. It could be an investment in new sites or better management through different tools. One of the most important points of all of this is that financial success in salmon farming is fundamentally linked to impact success. It is an industry that actually responds to positive incentives where profit and change actually go hand in hand. It's an investment opportunity, ESG improvements, and environmental progress all in one. So investment opportunities, right? Uh, as a note, farmed salmon, so about two thirds of all salmon sold, are definitely controversial. That's why it's really important to dive into the data of these industries and to understand how sustainability works in the space and how it can be further improved. Salmon farms are more than just profits, they're employers, communities, and stewards of the environment around them. So there's five to six main routes of financing and, and pretty much everything, but salmon farming as an industry has a lot of capital constraints. So number one, family matters, right? So 80% of the top 50 salmon farming companies are family owned, and a lot of consolidation has occurred in the industry over the past 15 years, but with more than 300 smaller scale operators operating sites and the average age of company owner is about 60 years old, there's plenty of room for more consolidation. Right now, the families mostly finance through retained earnings. They're forced to keep money on hand and they have a lot of cash, but there's a difference between having cash and being able to deploy cash. And then number two is growth equity. So the oldest method in the book, potentially besides debt, a list on a public exchange. Salmon farms can list on the Oslo Boards Exchange, giving them access to institutional investors. The only problem with this is the general IPO pop. So also the oldest method in the book when these companies list, they're still relatively small, meaning that once the initial interest goes away, all they are left with is regulatory headaches and trouble raising additional capital. Number three is debt. So there are three, three, three banks that lend to salmon farms, which is not a lot. In-house expertise is important to set the price of these loans, which is why the lending pool is so small, going back to whaling BC yet again. There is more room for lending here through green bonds meeting those sustainability goals or simply through salmon farms having more optionality around commercial debt opportunities, competition, breeds, innovation, especially in debt markets. And then there's reinsurance. So this is a tool that helps lenders isolate specific sources of credit risk. This is not hot. This is really not great for the lenders, for the insurers. Salmon farming is rather expensive for the insurers to insure because salmon farming is volatile and they pay out more than they receive in payment, which isn't great from the insurer's perspective. There's a lot of room for innovation here, which across all insurance, let's be real. And number five is private equity. So the whaling VCs are back, right? Private equity hasn't really worked in salmon farming, mostly because the ocean industry is ripe with information asymmetry. However, with the right information, there's a lot of opportunity for PE firms to meet their goals in this space. Bain was in this space, a giant private equity firm. Bain went into this space in 2014, buying 
buying a salmon farm in Chile, which was falsifying documents. <laughs> so it wasn't a great investment. It's a big capital constraint to the industry and the five tools listed above don't really allow salmon farms to truly grow to the level that they could. There's room for more investment, not only for the salmon farms themselves to grow, but also for investors to benefit from capital appreciation in this industry. Let's quantify the risk and reward. So why is this good? Look at this graph. It reveals the profitability and the sustainability of salmon farming from the Norwegian portfolio. And so you can see compounded return on capital employed. So the Norwegian portfolio delivered 24% ROCE, so very good return on capital employed. And 60% of all portfolios are better than that average, offering the higher expected return for a given level of risk. The point number two is analyze risk return profiles of US European stock markets. So salmon provided a higher risk return performance than that of value stock in terms of EBITDA EV ratio. And so that is just simply a valuation ratio. So this is saying that, that these salmon farms are undervalued relative to stocks and have outperformed them. They're performing in the upper quintile relative to these stocks. And then number three is true sustainability. Basically, the greener the dots, the better in this graph. And the more that investors are rewarded with improved risk adjusted returns while choosing more sustainable portfolios. This space has a low correlation with the rest of the market. The volatility in oceans is not like the volatility in the markets. And salmon returns are not correlated with market returns, which gives a little bit of a diversification opportunity. Getting a little bit more into the numbers, Scoot Science developed something called the green sharp ratio to analyze the investment opportunities. Diving into this balance reward risk relative to the impact of different projects. Looking at this table, it's clear that salmon investing delivers a much higher green sharp ratio, meaning that it delivers substantial reward relative to its impact. So what is the improved environmental impact? One of the most important points of all of this is how can we make the world better, right? So salmon is a great alternative protein source. If you've seen the lentil piece, it's not, this is not the same vibe of like, go eat lentils. Salmon is actually a good alternative protein source to traditional meat options. It's low impact, it's nutrient dense, and it's not a vehicle for greenhouse gas production like cows are. It's quantifiable impact too, producing far less CO2 equivalent than beef, pork, and, and other dairy products. And as you can see, farmed fish like salmon produce roughly the same amount of GHGs as eggs and 80% of the GHGs of chicken, providing a more sustainable protein option. The industry is actively working to make this even more sustainable through different feed options, managing mortality, etc. And some of the ways that they're doing this is just improving mortality metrics. So less salmon deaths, the better, right? And tech is making that a little bit easier to achieve. They're also improving the economic feed conversion ratio. So making sure that food is used efficiently and then improving the feed composition. So using sustainable soy and helping to reduce global annual emissions there as well. Essentially, the goal is to make an industry that is truly green and the farms are already making active strides in order to achieve that. And that helps to make progress towards this broad concept of ESG investing. Geification, right? It's no secret that there's a gap between the environmental part of ESG and the actual impact. Funds have mandates in place that encourage them to invest in companies that support the concept of environmental social governance, meaning that they are socially conscious, so they take care of nature, people, and the company itself. The concept of ESG is great. Like, we really need more green energy investment, and we need to make sure those in power actually care about this stuff, right? The only problem is ESG is more of a label than a literal. It's a way to meet fun requirements, but it's not really a way to improve the world. There is a difference between mandates and meaning. ESG is much more of the former than the latter. There needs to be something that fulfills both and takes this $35 trillion ESG industry and funnels it into something that is potentially actually useful and has a true impact. So environmental, so salmon farming is a great way to actually match the ESG to make a positive impact on the environment through a sustainable ocean economy and really have a more sustainable and have a future in, in itself. And social, so salmon producers are incentivized to take care of the ocean and taking steps to improve nutrients and water quality quality for the fish, and that ends up being a healthier world around them, right? Healthier oceans, healthier salmon, healthier ecosystem. And governance. And salmon farming also provides jobs. In British Columbia, the farmed salmon industry employs 7,000 people, which is really important for these rather remote coastal communities. And so we can quantify this a little bit more. The UN has sustainable development goals that help to evaluate opportunities and risks and to make sure we don't wreck the planet in five years. The salmon farming industry is built around several of these sustainable development goals. The first one being climate action. So farmed salmon is a low impact source of protein. Zero hunger. Aquaculture is a great way to start feeding people. And then good health and well-being. So salmon is more than just protein. It's also good for your brain because of the oils. Salmon farming solves for each level in the ESG trifecta 
trifecta and is actively improving upon each element of it while meeting the goals of the UN SDG. It's an interesting investment opportunity and a way to really help the world in a sustainable fashion. So some final thoughts, human farms are above market return opportunities that are non-correlated to the broad market while also providing support to an ecosystem that needs investment. Sustainability isn't something that can be solved by simply snapping your fingers. It will require investors and industries to collaborate on building a better future. And we can't pretend that the world is going to solve this altruistically. Humans are always going to human. So salmon farming is one option for a balance, offering a lower environmental impact with a higher risk reward opportunity and building towards a better future. The salmon industry is complicated, but it's an important industry that is capital constrained. It's a low carbon source of protein, a stronger source for ESG mandates, and a profitable investment opportunity. This is a rising tides moment. The earth is literally on fire and we have to start making incremental steps to make that world better. And this is just one of many options to do that. So thanks so much for hanging out. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Like I said at the beginning, this piece is in partnership with Scoot Science. I really believe in what they're doing. I think that it's really important to invest in like the non-traditional ways that we think about green energy. I think that salmon farming and just making that a more sustainable path is really important. Like just making everything, every sector of the economy a little bit more sustainable is going to go a long way in making everything more sustainable. So if you want to go check them out, details in the description box below. This is a newsletter, kyla.substack.com. It's also TikTok form, and which is on Instagram, YouTube shorts, and TikTok itself. I hope that you're having a great day and go eat some salmon if you eat fish and care for the world around you. And I will see everybody soon. Bye.